Uh, a bit about ourselves. Uh, we are a digital solutions builder. Uh, we've been in business since um, early 90s. We're based out of Washington, D.C. in Rockville, Maryland. Uh, we've served customers over the past 25 years in Middle East, uh, North America, Pakistan, and a couple of other regions. Uh, we have been working in um, different industries. These include military, telecom, banking, um, and public sector. Um, we also have been uh, working with many startups. Um, it's kind of a split between enterprises and startups. So we help startups. Um, we, we help actually become their, you know, we become their engineering arms and we help convert their ideas into, into global products. Um, the other half of the customers are the enterprises and we work in different technology areas and these include the likes of AI. So we have a team that does the code development as with any technology solution, there's always some kind of code involved. So we have a group that you see on the top left, they develop the code, um, they do all the data science work which includes analytics. Uh, descriptive, predictive, prescriptive analytics. Uh, we have a team that does the deployment uh, of the solutions. AIQ team develop karti hai. Uh, there's an infrastructure team that deploys these on various um, uh, infrastructure platforms like cloud or on-prem or hybrid or multi-cloud. And then on the top right, you see the cybersecurity group. Aajkal cybersecurity is very important. Hai. Um, as with any industry, especially in oil and gas, which are critical industries for any country which, which are part of the critical infrastructure and you cannot afford to uh, you know have the systems down even for a couple of hours so security is very important so we are working with uh, we're working on cyber security for operational technology that is ot and we're also, of course working for cyber security for ip and then there are a couple of other groups like enablement um, operation support and help desk. so once you have a solution deployed there are people who are required uh, to to support those products these are some of the uh, industries that we have served. So these include um, telecom, uh, auto and transport, uh, banking and finance, public sector, food and travel, manufacturing, healthcare, utilities, as well as um, mm -hmm. education sector. So with this, I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Kamar Sharif, who is leading the innovation in oil and gas for SPS. Dr. Chap, over to you. Thank you very much. So you can see my screen now. OK. Yes, Doctor. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is SPS website for innovation in oil and gas. You can see me on the left side, and you can also see Hakman Hassa uh, in the middle, and uh, he is today's uh, uh, featured speaker. So what I wanted to encourage each one of you and show you that below here, we have a little sign for Shell, Saudi Aramco, Schlumberger, Microsoft, Marathon Oil, Philips 66, Exxon, Aramco again. Next is a Schlumberger company, training company, and Chevron, and BP, and Sensia. So we have put there these links just for anybody who comes to this website to see that what these companies are doing in the international arena. Okay, it is phenomenal. It's mind-boggling it is very motivating and encouraging that where these people are and where our industries in pakistan so i want to encourage you to please look into this what we have started with this initiative that last week we had a uh, webinar we invited about 200 plus public and private universities departments into the webinar. There were about 70 people who attended from different universities, and we pre presented one project to them, and this is anybody who wants to work on it, and they can, that how we can transmit uh, well data from a remote location where there is no electricity, where there's no power, or uh, there is a power, but there is no Wi-Fi, to a, uh, to a smart phone. So I know Halliburton and Schlumberger mm -hmm. and other companies and Saudi Aramco, they all have that thing. So we are not doing any new invention. What we are trying to do that if we can develop the same thing with Internet of Things, with uh, artificial intelligence, with telecommunication, and do this thing in Pakistan, 
For example, if we can monitor a flow rate at a well, be it a oil, a gas, uh, uh, water, so this, if they, we can develop this technology, those sensors are already built. The game is that we transmit data, data securely to a computer, and then we monitor it and do all things with that data analysis. So if we can do it on, on one well, we can do it in on 10 wells replicated for the field. We can do it for the company who have 10 fields. We can do it for all the companies in Pakistan. We can uh, ask Ministry of uh, Petroleum to actually make it compulsory for them to so that and Ministry can in real time look each well how much oil, how much water, how much gas it is producing. The Sui Northern, Sui Southern, and other companies, they can put sensor at one point and then put other sensor on the next point, and then, then they can measure and record if there is any pilferage, if there is any leak in the line between point A and point B, because flow rate or quantity flowing from point A should be same as equal to point B. So if they are not the same, it means something is happening. So there are multiple applications of that. So this is something I thought of and I said, OK, because one thing people think that, oh, if I have an idea, it is my confidential, it is my secret, and then people die with that. Because today's ideas, you know, ideas are like a sperm. Only one in a million have the chance to become a human being. OK, and to 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 develop idea, to make a prototype, to do everything, you need four, five, six people. OK, you need an accountant, you need uh, a, a log person, you need a technology person, you need a marketing person before you can actually even get the uh, seed money to develop that idea and uh, before you can become a startup. So our objective is actually, this is how uh, Hashmat Malik, my old uh, class fellow from engineering university who was based in Maryland, he encouraged me after retirement that Kamar, yaar, hum to retire and kuch kar sakte to chalo agar hum jo Pakistan mein young pod hai, bache hai nahe, unki koi help kar sake aur hum academy, academia ko aur industry ko or your technology providers, if we can bring them together and encourage, or Allah kare hamara agar ek bacha bhi kisi maksad mein kamyab ho jata hai, he becomes an entrepreneur, so mashallah he will be able to employ 50 people rather than he is looking for a job by himself. So this is our objective, this is our vision, we encourage young people, if we can make money on the way, that's okay. But even if we don't make any money, because I learned from so many people. So it is my honest and humble duty that I pass the torch and make other people, young people especially, aware. And we have barriers here, university professors or students or the industry. We try to bridge that gap. Inshallah. So with this, I uh, uh, welcome Mr. Hakmin Haas. Uh, I think he doesn't need any introduction because he has been in the industry and most of the people know him already. So Haq Sahib, I give the floor to you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sahib. <clears throat> it's uh, very nice. In fact, uh, your especially your project that you mentioned it's uh, it's so exciting, and uh, wish you the best luck with this uh, this uh, project. It's it's really a great idea. Well, आप भी इसपे कुछ सोचना चाहे या कोई और बच्चे हैं या कोई oil company है क्योंकि मैंने आज OGDCL से बात की वहाँ पे जो है गुलदेश साहब हैं आज collecting director production के उन्होंने कहा अगर किसी बच्चे को कोई university या किसी को कोई well चाहिए हम उनको दे देंगे वहाँ से कुछ वो उन्होंने मैया कहते हैं लेना Michael, thank you very much. I'm trying to see if there are some students in the university who are PPL with us. And we will coach them during this, their final year project. Absolutely. No, I, I actually looked at your project and I, I, we can have a separate discussion 
uh, perhaps okay. this project can be done in two phases. In the first phase, uh, you can start collecting data through through phone, mobile phone. Somebody at the well site, you can just start uh, giving daily daily data, and uh, that way, in fact, you can uh, enable the data collection from different wells uh, um, very quickly. And once you have data, you can show it to people that what you can do with the data that will motivate people to put some gadgets there. Yes. So in the that, that, first phase, data collection can be even even done manually. That, that is wonderful, which is being done right now. Yeah. The, okay. All the all, right. all the production data is being collected manually. All the no, but but, but, but it stays it stays there at the well site and it is transmitted manually to 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 different companies. So if that can go directly through mobile phones into some database, uh, which is quickly accessible to everyone, yeah, uh, actually, that would be a step change. I, I want to talk to Tahir about this because Tahir, you know, he is yeah. already uh, part of the uh, because they can a puzzle here, us make a dust moving part. Hai. So yes. Tahir is probably one of that. He is already taking care of one of that thing. So he could be very instrumental. So we and but okay, um, let's uh, let's do let's your presentation it. today because yeah, this is our objective and then we can discuss this and we can ask Tahir to come and we can invite other people and uh, work on this little further. Absolutely. I think you have to Darshab, remove your uh, screen sharing so that I can share my screen. Oh, sorry. OK, yeah, OK. Uh, all right. So <clears throat> this is uh, a very brief. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you later on why I call reinventing. OK, at the towards the end, I will I will slowly reveal that why I'm calling reinventing. It is something that we are doing different in Pakistan. So but the topic of my talk is reinventing innovation for Pakistan. All right. Uh, this is my small introduction. I'm directed in two companies. I have been previously working with uh, uh, four different companies. But uh, anyway, so this is let's start. What we'll do, do is, in fact, I'm not talking really about a presentation. This is a conversation that will spend about 30 minutes on that. And uh, we'll discuss that what is innovation the way I understand it. Uh, why do we need to innovate? What are innovation blocks? How can we innovate every day? What is disruptive innovation? And once we talk about blocks of innovation, what are the blockbusters for innovation? Uh, how innovation can impact growth? Uh, how we can do uh, innovation in our oil industries in Pakistan? I'm going to talk in perspective of Pakistan. I'll try to link how innovation is perceived and what is innovation in the in the Western world or in the rest of the world and what is uh, the meaning of innovation for us? Why do we need a paradigm shift? And then uh, towards the end, we'll talk about reinventing innovation for Pakistan. And I hope you'll find it interesting. And first, really, I appreciate Dr. Uh, Kamar Javed for, uh, for for giving me this, uh, this uh, opportunity. This topic is very close to my heart. I have been discussing with many people, many different new ideas. And every time I discuss about new ideas, I, I come up with some kind of stumbling blocks. And I wanted to really pass on my this frustration to somebody. And this is an excellent forum. Uh, <clears throat> we said innovation is basically it has three components. Number one is it's a new idea. That has been implemented or can uh, is implemented and it uh, creates value. So if we have three components together, then we call that that is really innovation. We may have an idea if it is not implemented or if it doesn't add value, that is not really innovation. So the, uh, an innovation has to have these three components. Another way of defining innovation is for some people it is and that's in fact much more applicable over here. Something new or different introduced that adds value. It could be, in fact, a departure from our conventional way of doing things. We have been doing things in a certain way, but if we can, uh, if we do those the same things differently, that can add value. That's innovation. All right. So, not innovating is very scary because opposite to innovation is basically stagnation. So, if we don't innovate, we stay on the horizontal line. We don't really progress. The only way to move up from this horizontal line is from stagnation is to innovate, innovate and innovate. All right. So innovation is 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 so important for any progress. And there are so many studies that have been done that show a correlation between innovation and 
GDP of a country, many different indicators of the development of that country. It could be GDP, it could be life expectancy, could be anything. So uh, these are, for example, this is only for Europe. This is uh, GDP on the x-axis and the y-axis. You have basically uh, millions of uh, uh, number of patents per million of population. And you can see, in fact, a very nice correlation. Uh, countries having more patents have higher GDP. Uh, if we start all the way in, in, in Europe from Portugal all the way to Sweden, so there is a lot of variation and a good correlation between uh, uh, GDP per capita and the number of uh, patents. This is one graph from uh, US. Uh, in fact, this was a very interesting paper and uh, I can share this with you if, if, if you like, which correlates the uh, number of patents to life expect expectancy at birth. In fact, life, life expectancy at birth is correlated again with GDP. So this is a kind of indirect uh, correlation with, with GDP. And it's an excellent correlation. Okay, so, and I'll, I'll explain you later on why there is this kind of exponential growth over here. Later on. We have to understand that innovation is different from invention. Innovation is from that perspective, as you will notice that innovation is not really difficult, but it adds tremendous amount of value. Examples are invention was done. Computers were invented in 1945. Computers are so big that it basically filled almost a room. Carl Benz invented automobile in 1885. It was a luxury accessible only to very few people. They couldn't sell probably more than a dozen cars. Then there was innovation. Bill Gates decided to brought, bring that PC to every home. And he started this idea in 1975. Steve Jobs made the computers a fun. I have basically all my Macintosh over here. Then uh, Ford Model T that was introduced in 1908. The, the Carl Benz in, invented that automobile in 1885, was not very popular, but the innovation done by Ford in 1908 that basically replaced all the horses, they were no more needed. So basically that changed the way that we travel. So that is really innovation. In, innovation can change, take the whole thing by storm, it can change everything. In some cases, innovation can be disruptive. That can basically go through this. If you look at the right side, this graph, it can uh, replace all the existing technologies and uh, and compete with them. It can kill all the competition. The example is on the left side is that these are all the different uh, stores, uh, Walmarts and all that different stores. On one column, you can see their market value in 2006. For example, if you look at Sears, it was $27 billion in 2006. In 2016, it was $1 billion. JP, Jesse Penny, that was $18 billion in 2006. In 2016, it was just about $2.6 billion, and so on, and the list goes on. Now, where all this money disappeared, it all this money went to Amazon. That grew from, in 2006, from $17 billion to 2016 to 356 billion dollars so this one company with just a new idea of making a uh, sale online this basically changed completely the way that people do this shopping and replace everything it was not a new invention it was just an idea of using the the, the internet and everything available technology to do something different all right if innovation is so nice, if it can change things so quickly and so drastically and make a huge impact on our life and uh, our uh, growth and everything, let's see what are the blocks to innovation. Why don't we, why can't we innovate? And when I looked at different issues, I mean, people can probably add here uh, many different uh, uh, reasons. But to me, what it seems like blocks, are, number one is that quite often on our businesses and all our countries, we have short term drivers. We think only about next year. What is the, our revenue is going to be next year? 
in political government, we think about what is going to happen within the next five years for the elections. We don't have long-term goals. Whereas any innovation, if we do it today, it will take at least five, ten years before we can get its benefits. We have many skeptics to innovation. If we try to do something different, people look at you, frown at you, well, what are you doing? Okay. Uh, in my village, if I try to do something different, people used to say, Buddha Agya Science Dan. I hope you understand me. Eh? Uh, science Dan Bini, what they say? Buddha Agya Science Dan. Then, another reason is that we have a lack of IP rights. Copying, imitating is very common. You just bring anything in the market and second day you, there will be dozens of copies of, of, of its, its copies will be there in the market. So the inventor or the innovator really doesn't get any benefit. Our attitude is playing safe. We tend to do what is, we try to basically walk the proven paths, what is safe, okay? We don't try to take risk. So all, always we try to play safe. These are kind of what I thought was the, was the blocks to innovation. All right. How can we remove these blocks? How can we encourage people and everyone and ourselves to take risk? We have to allow mistakes. People who make mistakes, they are punished. That attitude has to change. What is really has been done in, in, uh, in recent countries, especially in US, people found a way of creating wealth through knowledge through the use of IP rights. If somebody invents something only with his knowledge, he can make millions and millions from that, just from that knowledge. So creation of wealth through knowledge, that can only happen if you have a strict application of IP rights. Skeptics are there, but we have to ignore skeptics. I'll show you some examples of skeptics. We have to think long-term goals. If we put all those blocks over here, instead of doing everything in a conventional way, we have to think outside the box. If we stay in the box, of course the box itself staying in the box is that means it's a very safe environment. We are well protected. We do things, we don't make mistakes. We do things that everybody is doing. We do things that our forefathers have been doing. We play safe, all right? We can stay inside the box but we can only do different things if we can come out of that box so we have to think out of box it is not a comfortable place to to stay it is more risky place but that is the only way that we can innovate we have to challenge ourselves we have to think differently ip rights now earlier i've shown you this slide in a different way but let's see in fact in us what was the reason of this number of patents growing exponentially from 1995 onwards. That was when the international patent law trips were introduced. So look in fact how much this IP rights can impact innovation. A strict application of IP rights. That is really so easy, so important. Another reason of this thing was I believe is the easy internet information that was available accessible to everyone. Now that basically shows two things. Number one is that IP rights, and second is that without knowledge, without information, you cannot really innovate. There was another study that I didn't really put slide over here that shows that the average age of innovators is slightly increasing over time. People were innovating, uh, if you look at the histogram, people were innovating at the age of uh, 25. Then after some time in recent years, people on the average age of innovator is about 30 years or 35 years. And one reason of that increase in age is that before you can innovate, you can do something different. You really have to understand and know all the information that has been accumulated so far. So as time goes by, innovation will become more and more difficult. I'm talking about innovation in the West. Okay, but innovation here in Pakistan will be a a different thing. Ignoring skeptics is very important. An example is that no less than IBM chairman in 1943, he said that I think there is a world market of maybe five computers. And this is, who is saying that? IBM chairman, Thomas Watson. 
Fortunately, Bill Gates didn't listen to that, and he decided that he's going to basically flourish every home with computers. And today, in fact, in my home, I have five computers. So don't listen to skeptics. Another interesting thing is, this is one saying from Giovanni uh, Corazza, who is uh, a, a creative uh, thinking university, uh, founder of that. He says that a quick jump out of the box is more insightful than a lifetime of stranded thinking. So basically, what he is, 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 what he is saying is that uh, innovation can be fun. It is not just for money, but it can be fun. Doing something different, doing something challenging, uh, challenging your own way of doing things, challenging the way your forefathers and everybody around is doing things, that is actually challenging. That's, that's entertaining. It's fun. Now, if we put all this thing in perspective, I believe innovation is a piece of cake if we can make it a habit. How can we do that? Innovate every day, everywhere, every time. When we walk into the office, we can question ourselves why we are doing things this way every time. How can we do the same thing differently? That is actually innovation. Innovation doesn't have to be kind of flashy and, uh, and a breaking news. It can be little pieces of, inf of innovation everywhere in our lives, in our environment, everywhere. We have to ask the question, why do we do it the way we do it? How can we do it differently? And eventually, that's, that little steps of improvement will take us to, uh, to, to improving the quality of life, uh, uh, improving everything that we do, and doing it different, differently. At the same time, people who are under your influence, we, have to, we, we should encourage them or encourage others to innovate. We don't discourage new ideas. I think this, we, if we take this thing as a, as a mission, as a goal, perhaps we can create a, a culture of innovation in our country. Now, let me switch gears a little bit here and talk about some easy innovation in our industry. Of course, when we say about innovation, perhaps in our industry we do innovation. We need innovation, of course. There are two ways of doing things. One is that we probably do innovation. We bring some kind of flashy new instrument. We bring uh, a different way of drilling wells. Uh, we create very complex wells and innovate uh, uh, everything. We maybe uh, we spend uh, millions of dollars and develop some new instruments. But let's try to do it differently. In fact, while we go into that arena of uh, uh, leading edge technology and development, there are many fundamentals that we need to correct. We have to use best practices of field development that we are not doing that. Our process review, we don't really question the way we are doing things. We need to bring a cold eyes and, and let people review our processes the way we are doing that. We can do ourselves, but the thing is that if we keep on doing the same thing, that looks okay to us. We have to let some cold eye look at those things. Competency development, that is so essential. It is so easy to do, but will have far-reaching impact, huge impact on anything that we do. If we have competent people, everything that they do will be different. I'm adding here data analytics. Why is that easy? If we develop a, a, a new drill bit probably that will be very very expensive we don't have technology we don't have that materials we don't have anything of that to do that but data analytics today which is becoming so common and it is such a useful fantastic technique that uh, uh, we don't have i mean we don't have too many simulation experts for example in pakistan but really do we need that today the data science has become so important and so advanced that but by looking at production data for example of hundreds of, of wells i can understand the geology i can build a top-down model starting from data going all the way down into the reservoir 
and I can build a model that is quite often as reliable as a simulation that is done over maybe in two years. I can do it in, in maybe in a week time. And what's more, we don't need anything. We just need some brains and people with simple computers, which is easily available here in our country. And data analytics is something that is is a is today is a has become not just a fashion, but people have realized more and more that that is uh, really the way to go. We have data available with all these wells equipped with the uh, with fancy fiber optics and the SCADA system that we have tons of data available. Nobody is really using that data. If we can make use of that data and 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 develop our models in such a way that that uh, that can help us understanding the reservoir and optimizing it and uh, identifying, for example, uh, some bypass trial and it has infinite kind of applications and it is so easy to do. That is probably one thing that if we want to do any research in our industry, in our universities, this is where I will I will do that. In all this thing, what I real, uh, really I found was that whenever you go and talk to these ideas to anyone, people become defensive. They, they don't accept that thing. They say that, well, we have been doing this thing for the last 30 years. If you do it differently, does it mean that what I've been doing is, uh, is wrong? That is, we have to change that mindset. We really have to change that mindset. It is not important who is right, it is important what is right. So taking you back to Pakistan again, uh, life expectancy chart in Pakistan, but earlier we said that life expectancy in US has increased a lot. In Pakistan, we are not too, too bad. Look at this thing from 1950s to today, our life expectancy has increased fantastically from 45 to 67. Was it the result of any innovation that we did? No, it was borrowed innovation. It was the innovation that was happening in, in West, vaccines and all that, those things that we used and we basically got benefits. So innovation today in the, in the, in, in the, in the world, innovation has uh, effect, will affect other countries also. But if we keep depending on this borrowed innovation, the gap between us and the West will keep on growing. We have to do our own innovation. Another thing is innovation is not something that is written on a stone. It is not, it doesn't have a definition that is fixed in time and space. It varies in time and space. What was new 50 years ago is not new today. What is new for a developing country may not be new for a developed country. All right, so we don't have to basically use the word innovation in the same context as a Western country is doing or as US is doing. Our definition of innovation is anything that we can, that can add value in our own processes, in our own way of life. A departure from conventional way of doing things that can add value is innovation, all right? So innovation is quite often we we kind of uh, confuse this word innovation as, as something flashy, something completely different, something that we can publish papers and do this thing and do that thing. No, innovation is anything that can add value in the way we are doing things. We must innovate our cultural blocks. We have to innovate our mindset. This is also innovation. We have to innovate our processes. We have to innovate our education system and competency of people. These, all these things need to be changed. That is all innovation. In fact, we, I call these as invisible innovations, but will have huge impact on our society. And that's the only way that we can catch up with the West. If we can start talking about the uh, leading edge and cutting edge technology, and we don't change the fundamentals, we are not going, we are never going to catch up with the West. We may inject a lot of money, the same thing we are saying. So again, I'm putting that thing, uh, uh, this guy, Thomas uh, Huxley, that it is not who is right, but what is right, that is of importance. 
we have to change the mindset of sabacha so every every time we discuss with people uh, the first answer is everything is fine i don't have any problem okay so that mindset of sabacha is has to be changed we have to challenge ourselves we have to be open what what the problem our problem is that we think this way that if i am wrong then it's okay acceptance will help me improving and becoming a better professional being wrong is okay we have to accept that right we are human beings we can make mistakes i have been doing things certain certain things in in a way that my father told me that's okay but if today i can accept that well in fact what i have been doing is can be done in a better way i should accept that on the other hand if my project is wrong it is not okay because that will hurt my company and my country okay so we have to basically come out from this personal ego and we have to uh, accept challenge and uh, and challenge others other invisible innovations in petroleum sector is that which are i think which can change many things Devel- development of competent workforce the best practices of explo- exploitation develop a local service industry this is something that has not is not being done i was in in malaysia and uh, i was surprised that then in malaysia what they they did was they try to basically force every service provider to have a local component in that in their company unless any service provider does not have a local component of something like 20 30% of a local partner they won't allow that person that company do anything here we really are not developing local industry uh, service industry and where this technology is being developed is in the service industry so our service industry is completely ignored this is to me this is a crime it has its 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 impacts are number one uh because most of the innovation and uh, r and d happens in fact in, in in the service industry so we don't have a developed service industry our services are very expensive because we are at the mercy of those uh, uh, foreign service providers and uh, we we cannot today for example we cannot uh, drill shale wells they are very expensive because we don't have fracturing here we don't have uh, technology to drill horizontal wells so these technologies if they are there they are easily available through some some local service industry that can basically uh, help in many many ways generate jobs uh, basically uh, improve our uh, innovation r and d and everything uh, you know better than i do that in us the force behind the development of shale gas is their local service industry and very strong service industry another big problem that we have is uh that our information that we have we try to basically hide it we close it we keep it close to our 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 hearts okay we don't share that information we don't collaborate perhaps we are afraid that if for example it's like a like a secret that if other people know this thing uh, they will steal from me we have to create a collaborative open environment i put this little cartoon we have to believe our new mantra should be knowledge is power and our mindset of that boss is the power whatever he says is right we don't want to do anything different that has to change after having said all that i wonder that why are we not innovating ourselves out of the mess that we are in i believe that all country that the mess that we are in is because we have been doing the same things over and over again we are we don't have courage to challenge ourselves we uh, did not try to innovate and we are as a result we are stagnant for 75 years thank you very much hakmin hasa a uh, very nice very innovative very encouraging presentation so now i will open the floor for questions so you can uh, either uh, 
raise your hand or you can turn on your mic and ask the question directly. Or I will request uh, our host, uh, Mr. Hashim Brak, to coordinate the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Akmin Asa. So uh, if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Um, G.S. Krishna. Uh, it's not really a question, but just a few things which I want. I mean, uh, when Mr. Minahas was speaking, I just noted a couple of things here. Uh, the problem of not taking a risk and playing safe, that's a, a biggest problem in Pakistan. Because uh, I was just uh, hearing one interview, I think it was, uh, uh, what is this? Uh, uh, Khakan Abbasi was telling that uh, uh, he signed something, a uh, contract for uh, LNG, and uh, he is uh, he was behind bars because of that, you know. And uh, uh, now the people are playing very safe. Nobody wants to put their signatures on anything, you know. So that is a big problem with Pakistan, you know, that uh, the people cannot take any risk, and uh, uh, they everybody is playing safe now. Nobody wants to take any. Uh, steps uh, uh, take take uh, active uh, role in anything, you know, because uh, the political situation in Pakistan is so unstable that every second year there is uh, some problem, and uh, the NAP come into action and they start uh, investigating what the other people have done. So that's the one thing which is a big problem there. And those is, the other thing which is uh, a Copyright uh, things, you know, the problem of copyright in Pakistan, that is the biggest problem because uh, unless those laws are strict, people will not, people even they are, there. I have, I see a lot of people have innovated a lot of things, but then stealing and making a, a copy of the things and, uh, uh, you know, that's very easy. No, nobody has any kind of control on that and that uh, discourages the people so much, you know. That nobody wants to put their money because R and D it's a it's a biggest thing which uh, uh, any developed country will you know become innovative because they are R and D department and we when you do the R and D you spend a lot of money out of your pocket you know companies spend a lot of money here to innovate but if they know that next day somebody will copy and then uh, they will be out of uh, uh, you know uh, picture. That is the problem. Like uh, people do so much in invention in a new medicines and new uh, kind of uh, technologies. And if they don't have any right, they will never be able to recover their money which they have spent on the R&D. So that's why the R&D here is a protected and the innovation is protected because somebody invent any medication, they are protected for seven years. They can make their money, you know. And then they have the right, uh, the people can make uh, generic uh, medication, you know. So that's what all I have. Thank you. No, that's that's a very fair comment, uh, uh, The second thing is that uh, this uh, copyright and making uh, creation wealth out of knowledge, that is the biggest motivating factor for people to do that. And if we take out that factor, if people know, well, in fact, uh, even if I keep spending nights and days on, on this thing and develop something new, uh, somebody is going to copy that. Uh, there is no motivation. So we really need to create many different motivating factors and push people to do that innovation. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, yeah. we had uh, just in the last meeting, we had uh, Mr. Nazir. He is in, um, in our group uh, member. He is a in Saudi Arabia, he has invented a lot of things uh, in solar power, solar yeah. energy. You know, he has uh, uh, very good uh, equipment. He has a lot of uh, gadgets. He has, uh, and but he is only afraid that uh, if he do something in Pakistan, somebody is going to copy it and uh, start uh, doing the same thing. You know, that was the biggest uh, fear he has. So that is a, a situation true. in Pakistan. All right, um, Dr. Kamar, would you like to add some closing comments? Uh, I would uh, thank uh, our guest speaker, Hakmin Asa, for uh, sharing his uh, valuable insight into the Pakistan, and uh, Asghar Sajid Saab, who is an experienced uh, uh, 
I don't want to call him Basuda Gheewal, otherwise he will say, oh, I'm too old. He is very young. He just told no, me no, before no. we started the, I, b- before no, we started no, the meeting, he said he is uh, 32 years old only. So <laughs> I'm very, okay. proud. I'm very so, proud of uh, my so, age. I'm 72 so, so years old. With, with, with this, and I think gradually what I am thinking that uh, we can continue this uh, uh, mode of one guest speaker, but I would like. I am thinking that we reduce this speed time and actually have mutual discussion. The three, four, five people talk about different ideas, and uh, so that we also uh, not just talk, but we find a way to move forward. We understand the issues, we understand the roadblocks, we understand the hurdles. But uh, we also know that the good way to travel is the is on the road which is less traveled. Absolutely. Yeah. So so that with this I will I thank again Hak Sahab and uh, Asil Sahab and everybody who came into the meeting and uh, spent their time with us. So inshallah we look forward to your time again. Yeah. We will have a next meeting third Thursday again of uh, next month october at the same time inshallah that's yep. this innovation idea is really excellent what you're doing is uh, is probably the most valuable thing we can do for pakistan for a country like pakistan and as you said uh, these ideas if we can if there is any vehicle any forum any mechanism through which we can implement our kind of uh, pass these ideas to the right people, right policy makers, that would be really fantastic. Inshallah. Inshallah, that is the objective.